I hate crime. It was a wet night. Perfect for a private eye to visit a new client. Number 93. Number 93 Harbor Drive was an old-fashioned two-storied brownstone house. I'm Larry Kemp. Please come in, Mr. Kemp. Come along here and sit down. Thanks. I'm Randolph Baxter. How do you do? Uh, won't you try that chair? Fine. Um, when you phoned, you said you needed help. Yes. Well, what's the trouble? Well, I... Uh, here. This is a photograph of my daughter, Marion. Uh-huh. She's my only child. Hmm. Pretty girl. Yes, but if she continues with what she's doing... My visit concerns your daughter, of course. Yes. Uh, please go on. Well, uh, lately I've noticed a change in Marion. Change? One moment she looks tired, almost ill, and then only minutes later she's bright. Wide awake. Uh-huh. And uh, why does that bother you? She's taking dope. Oh, I see. Catch her, Evan? She's not aware that I know. Yet you're sure? I found a weak supply of heroin needles in her purse. Oh. Oh... What do you want me to do? Find out where she's getting it. Tell me who's selling it to her and we'll report into the police. Well, you could call the vice squad For now. present, I'd rather have one reliable man working on it. But the vice squad's equipped to... My deal. Marion's my only daughter, remember? I think I have a right to settle this my way. Yeah, I... I guess you have. Will you accept the assignment? Yeah. Good. Then you can start in the morning... Baxter gave me a retainer. Then I went home and studied his daughter's photograph. It was a large studio color shot. Marion had light brown hair in a shingle cut. Brown eyes set wide apart. A small, firm chin. Generous lips. It was a serious face, except for the turned-up little nose that would wrinkle up when she left. Without even seeing her, I liked her. Wanted to help. The next morning, I was outside the Baxter house when she left. The picture didn't lie. She was a knockout. Taking drugs hadn't destroyed her looks, not yet. She hailed a cab and I followed her into town, sticking like plaster all day. Late that night, I reported to Baxter. So nothing, eh? Nothing suspicious. You sure? I'm positive. All right. Get some sleep and be here in the morning. I said I would. Then I hit the hay. At 9 a.m., Marion took a cab that dropped her at Paddington. I had luck with a parking space, then I walked behind her. On one corner, she stopped. Only momentarily, but long enough to take something with one hand and give away something with the other. The guy on the other end of the transaction became my new tail job. He took me to a pub where the barmaid called him Louie. Later, he led me to a block of flats. I was close enough behind him to hear a door slam. It was number three. 
Under that number on the flat directory was Mr. L. Stone. Then back to the pub where careful questioning of the barmaid identified L. Stone as Louis Stone, the guy I'd shadowed. I made another phone call. Randolph Baxter speaking. Larry Kent here. Where are you? In town. Your daughter back? She arrived a few minutes ago, but... I think I've got what you wanted. You mean... She accepted a small package from a guy named Louis Stone. Louis Stone? But I could be wrong. I don't think so. Will you come out here? Within a couple of minutes. I'll be waiting for you. When I got to Baxter's place, he let me in. Then he took me into the living room. His daughter was there. She stared at the floor. You were right, Kent. She had another week's supply in her purse. Oh, must you do this to me, Dad? It's for your own good. Tell her what you saw, Kent. Well, I... I saw your daughter accept a small package from a man. And? She gave him something in return. Money. I couldn't see what it was. It was money. I admit it. Drugs, drugs. I'll fight it, Dad. I... I want to fight You'll it. You'll fight it all right. How about Louis Stone, Mr. Baxter? Please ring the police for me. On Baxter's behalf, I notified the vice squad. Then I left. From there on, it was up to the Baxters and the cops. But at my apartment the same evening... Coming. Well, Inspector Daniels. Hello, Kent. Come in. Well? I was just talking to Randolph Baxter. Oh, what about? Louis Stone. Isn't that up to the vice squad? It started that way. But now it's homicide. How do you figure that? To use one of your American expressions, somebody put the finger on Louis. You mean... Yeah. How did it happen? Knife. He's flat. You don't think I did it? No, no. But someone may have seen you following him. Well, if they did, I don't know about it. Then there's nothing you can tell me? Nothing. All right. While I'm here, how about making me a cup of coffee? <laughs> the inspector had a few cups of my imported jabber and then went to play canasta at headquarters. I went to bed. Two full days of shadowing a day makes you lose your appetite for nightlife. After that, I tried to forget about Marion. I told myself that it wasn't my business, and it wasn't. But two weeks later, she was still in the back of my mind. Then one morning, she walked into my office. Mr. Kent, you must help me. She looked scared, haunted, sick. I helped her into a chair, closed the door. And waited for her to start talking. I... He doesn't understand. Who? Dad. He thinks I can just break the habit. You want some more of this stuff, huh? I, I'm not as strong as my father wants me to be. Oh, sorry, I, I can't get any for you. Oh, I know, I know, but... But you can talk to Dad. He might listen to you. Well, I, I, I won't suggest buying drugs for you. Oh, it's not that, Mr. Kenty. He keeps me in the house. I, I had to leave through the window. I, I can't fight alone. I need help. You poor kid. Come on, let's go. Why do you want to take me? To a doctor. Now, don't try arguing. Oh, I won't. Dr. Clayton was a special friend of mine. I explained the situation, and he agreed to send Marion to a private sanitarium. I signed a statement accepting full responsibility. Then I went to see Randolph Baxter. You know where she is? Yeah. Where? Where she can be taken care of. Tell me where. No. You've no right to... Your daughter needs help. She's getting it. In a few months, she'll be all right. If you keep her here, she'll go crazy. I just thought you'd like to know, but that's all I'm telling you. 
Leave this house. Mr. Baxter, I... I went. Later, I checked with Dr. Clayton. Marion was resting. He'd given her something. The idea was to make the doses smaller and smaller and then substitute something else. It was almost five when I started for the office. I figured there might be some mail. Just outside, a dame was standing. She looked at me, then came over. Mr. Kent? Yeah? I've been waiting here for hours. I... I need your advice. Well, come up to the office. There isn't time. My car's just around the corner. If you'll come to my flat... Why? Please. I'll tell you on the way. She had my arm and was steering me along the sidewalk. So I went with her. Her car was a big black imported job. She opened the rear door. Then I saw the guy inside. Jerry, I introduce Mr. Larry Kent. His right hand was outstretched, but we didn't shake. It was pointing at my stomach, and there was a gun in it. There I was, the car door open before me, a guy in the back pointing a 38 at my stomach. Just behind me was my new female friend. She had one of those cute little guns that you can hide in the palm of your hand. It was gently nudging my backbone. Please get in, Mr. Kent. If I don't... Then I'll let you have it, Private Eye. Here on the street... Make up your mind in three seconds or we'll take our chances. One. Two. Okay. Push past me, sit at the other end. Sure. The guy held his gun on me while the dame climbed in. Then he pushed it into my stomach. With his left hand, he took my thirty-two. You won't be needing this. All right, start driving, Mo. All right, Jerry. Those your right names? Shut up. For a dame, she drove pretty well. Except when we went around corners. Then I had to hold on to the leather strap above the window. Jerry did the same with his left hand, keeping the gun pointed with his right and staring at me. But after five or six turns, the movement became natural. Finally out in Parramatta, I saw a sharp one coming up in a busy section of town. As the car approached, I started lifting my right hand. Then Merle started turning. The door handle was just beneath my left hand. I hit it hard, set myself flying. me, Daniels. Go away. What happened? Who was in that car? The inspector's voice went off into space. And I didn't want it to come back. When I came back, he was gone. In his place was a dame who smiled anxiously. I reached out. Uh Uh-uh, you mustn't try to move. Oh, you said it. Where is this? You're in hospital. How bad am I? Fortunately, you have a head like a rock. Oh? How many bones broken? None. But you won't feel like shaving for a while. Bandages on my face. Cuts and abrasions all over your body. Bad? In a few weeks, you'll be as pretty as ever. 
Then I can drop around and pick you up, huh? That does it. You're well enough to see Inspector Daniels now. She brought him in. <laughs> Beauty and the beast. Then she left. Hello, son. We've been waiting for you to come around since yesterday. Oh, didn't you bring me any flowers? Not for once. Please don't be sarcastic. Who was in the car? A dame named Merle and a guy named Jerry. Ever seen them before? No. Did anybody see me fall from the car? Some pedestrians. Well, didn't any of them get the license number? <laughs> that only happens in fiction. However, I've got our portable rogues gallery outside. Like to look at some pictures? I did. Hundreds of them. Pickpockets, bashers, con men, dope peddlers. Male and female no-hopers of all descriptions. But Merle and Jerry weren't amongst them. Nor is Lewis Stone. You think there might have been a tie-up? Well, you reported Stone and then he was knifed. But over two weeks passed since then. Yeah, that's what puzzles me. The time lapse. Look, Inspector, Merle and Jerry could have been hired by one of the dozens of people. As you're usually quick to remind me, I'm not very popular in some quarters. But two complete strangers. Neither of them known or suspected criminals. Well, how does that tie up with Louis? Larry, there's a drug ring operating in Sydney. The people behind it are new. They're smart, careful. Our fizz gigs haven't been able to find out a thing. But why did the trail stop at Louis? How did Marion Baxter contact him in the first place? Through a drug addict woman friend who told her how wonderful it was. Did you get the friend? Yes. Then through her, another one. Then another and another. A long trail that always stops at Louis Stone. Hmm. And you think the ring wanted me knocked off, huh? Yes. Even if it did take them two weeks to make up their minds. If it was a simple job of murder in the usual way, the people hired would probably be known to us. The inspector left and I chewed over what he'd said. I went back over the case from the moment Randolph Baxter had hired me. I was sure that no one had seen me tailing Louis Stone. But I had to be wrong. Otherwise, why was Louis eliminated? Then it hit me. At first I shook it off, but... When I reviewed the case a few more times, I could see that it was all there. When they let me out of the hospital after a few days, I put a call through to Dr. Clayton. He gave me permission to visit his private sanitarium. Mr. Kent. Hello, Marion. Oh, your face. Oh, a few scratches, nothing serious. How are you? Fine. I was hoping you'd come to see me. Well, it's the first chance I've had. How are they treating you? They're wonderful here. Going to win out? I can't fail. Great. Uh, Dr. Clayton says he got you just in time. When drugs go too far... Yes. Yes, it's horrible. Only unhappy people take drugs. It's a rotten racket. Can we talk about something else? No. Marion, I, I think I'm onto something. Something that can break up the biggest dope ring in Australia's history. The same ring I was dealing with? Yeah, you want that busted wide open, don't you? Oh, yes, yes, I do. Well, you can help. How? I've asked Dr. Clayton if he'll let you leave the sanitarium for a day or so. But why? I told her. Then a few hours later, we drove to the city. Marion. Kent. Hello, Dad. I thought you'd like your daughter home, Mr. Baxter. Come in. Where have you been, Marion? A sanitarium. You should have stayed here. You didn't need the help of doctors. We could have fought it together. You're wrong, Mr. Baxter. Stay out of this, Kent. You're not weak, Marion. You're, you're strong. The others are weak fools and deserve everything they get. They're human beings, made slaves by the beasts who depend upon their weakness. It hit Baxter like a slap in the face. He staggered. Then he was fighting back. No one forces them. They go into it with their eyes wide open. They can stop any time they like. He was making it easy for me. This wasn't a lonely old man concerned about his daughter being a drug addict. This was a man on trial, reasoning, arguing, twisting things his way. You're not like them, Marion. You, you've proved that by wanting to get well. 
You've got my blood in your veins. We're all the same. We all have our weaknesses. No, I'm strong. I'd never let drugs get the best of me. If you were strong, you wouldn't take advantage of the weak. Someone has to sell them that. You've just confessed, Baxter. No. Oh. When you hired me, you told me that Marion had a weak supply of dope in a purse. Who but an expert could tell you that? But I... Uh, I hired you to find out who was selling it to Marion. Because you didn't know yourself. Then when I told you it was Louis Stone, you had him knifed before the cops arrived. Why should I have one of my own men murdered? I guess you could call it conscience. Someone had to be punished for bringing the habit to your daughter and you didn't have the guts to kill yourself. No! No, Mr. Kent! No! no. Oh, Mr. Kent, that's... Oh, that's absurd. You, you have it all wrong. You see, I... Don't move. The gun, a flat automatic, came from his dressing gown pocket. His quick move caught me flat-footed. You're so clever, Mr. Kent. You fitted the pieces together so perfectly. Except for the attempt on my life. You deserve to die. You took my daughter away. I could have cured her. Or let her die for being weak. You're insane. You very nearly broke my heart, Marion. Taking to drugs. Because I had no life. Because there wasn't any love in you. Oh, you'll understand, my dear, later. After I get rid of Mr. Kent. No! Marion! She had his wrist. He was pumping bullets into the ceiling. Marion! Let go! Let me go! But she didn't. Let go. I grabbed the first thing I could find, a heavy ashtray. When the cops came, Baxter wouldn't talk. <laughs> he didn't have to. After an all-day search, the cops came across something hidden in the house. A list of names, sums of money, transactions in heroin, marijuana, cocaine, morphine. They got the whole ring, including Merle and Jerry. I took Marion back to the sanitarium. Larry. You've got a lot to fight, kid. I know. I'll do it. That's the girl. Will you come to see me? As often as I can. Thanks. And when they let you out, I'll be waiting at this door. I won't be here long. She gets out tomorrow. A happy ending that could easily have been something else. One happy ending out of hundreds of stories. I'll be keeping my fingers crossed for Marion hoping she meets some nice guy who'll supply the love she never had. But it won't be me. Oh, no. No, I'm an investigator, and I've got a private eye that likes to wander around in all directions. Good night. Good night.